It's a story for West Street, it's a true story. Well, they all are, but some are true, I don't know. But this is a true story and it happened in the, about the 1730s, I believe. Now, one night, a, a host called Sequoy, Sequoy in Westry, there was a Rindle family lived there, mm -hmm. and the woman was sitting the one night doing a bit of spinning by the light of the cruisy lamp, and outside the wind was ghosting up the clothes. It was a, a night that was not fit to be wooded. It's a wild night, gale raging out. And the door opened and her husband came in and he says there's a big sailing ship heading towards the rocks. I'm gonna go and get Chuck Wienstein's and we'll go down and see if there's anything that we can do to help. We'll be careful, she says, there's no night to be out there. No, I can't. He said. So they get down to the shore and sure enough there was a big four-masted ship being driven towards the rocks and they could see that there was very little that they could do to help. They would strike the rocks further out than they couldn't get a boat out to that anyway in that sea and they were going to founder a bit offshore. Now on the ship the folk were running around in a blind panic and uh, they knew that their hour had come. This did not look good. They were heading towards the rocks. They couldn't steer the ship. They couldn't do anything. They were at the mercy of the sea. And the sea, as you know, has no mercy. Now on the ship, there was a woman. Some say she was the captain's wife. I have no idea who anybody would claim that. But there was a woman on board and she had a pretty boy with her. Just a toddler. And so she got the bairn, she tied it tight to her with a shawl, and just before the ship struck the rocks, she let down the side of the ship with the bairn in her hands, tied tight to tear. And the sea boiled and the ship was pushed against the skerries and the rocks tore the side of the hull of the ship open, and it broke up. And the folk on shore just had to watch helpless. There was not a thing that they could do. So they eventually, when it was dark and all day, they get home. And the next day, when the sun rose, they went down to see what they could salvage for the wreck. Because back in those days, times were hard and anything that you could get your hands on was welcomed, even if it came in a very sad way. And one person's misfortune was another one's good luck really because there was timber washed ashore and in an island like Westry and on the other ones here with no trees timber was an important and, and valuable commodity and so was the ropes and the sails as well and whatever cargo it was carrying so every now and again they would find a barrel washed ashore and they would care that up does anybody in the Orkney Kings, if you kept something off the shore up above high water mark, you've claimed it. And that's yours, and nobody talks that. And if anybody does, by their reputation, it's not worth a penny. So, they were carting up stuff, putting it above the high water mark, and every now and again they would come across a body. And they would pull it up to be buried later, by the side of the sea. They never buried them in the cupyards. They were always buried near the side of the wrecks. Now the man of Sequoia was wandering around as well and he saw a woman lying dead on the beach. And he thought, that's a terrible thing to see. And then he saw that she had a bairn tied to her. And the bairn made a bit of a cry, made a bit of a noise and, and moved slightly. So he saw it was still alive, only just but it was still alive. So he untied the bairn and he took it up, put it under his jacket and he ran home with it. And he gave it to his wife and she took the wee fella and stripped him off and dried him off with a towel, wrapped blankets around him, got him in front of the fire, warmed up a grain of milk and gave to him and the boy drank and he was fine. And he got stronger and stronger until he was just a perfectly healthy wee fella. 
and nobody knew anything about the ship that he came for. And the man of Seiko had found one piece, uh, one clue, which was just a scrap of wood, but it had writing on it. But he couldn't read, so he had no idea what it said. So he took it to the minister and he showed it to him. And the minister looked at it and he said, It says Archangel. That must have been a Russian ship. This must be its port of registration. But it's called Archangel. It's for northern Russia. And so they named the wee boy from the sea Archangel. <laughs> and Archangel grew up and got married and had a family, who I'll call Angel, of course. And the name of Angel lived on in Westry up until the end of the 19th century. And there was obviously a lot of girls in the family because the names um, disappeared as they married other people and took other names. Now, that's kind of usually where the story ends, but you see, me parents were old enough to have known better when I was born. So my dad was uh, 52, my mother was 41. My grandparents were born in the 1880s in Westry and Sandy. And the, um, my grandfather on my mother's side, Chordy Draper, was at school with Henry Mason, whose mother was Mary Angel, the last person in Westry to carry the name Angel. And one day they were doing extra work at school because they had a teacher there, a head teacher, that was very, very strict at the Skiller School. And if they did anything that upset them, annoyed them, then they would be kept back and they would get extra work to do. I think they call it detention these days. I think that the Burns had lots of names for it, but it wasn't as polite as detention. But they were back there doing long division, you know, they were on their old slates, you know, going <coughs> squeak, squeak, you know. And they could hear this mutter, mutter, mutter coming up the close, and it was Mary Angel. And the door opened, and Mary came in. Now, my mother always said that Mary Angel was a, a corset buddy. Um, I always pictured her as like Boris Yeltsin in a, in a heat scarf and a penny. And she came in, and she says to the teacher, Watch me, boy. And he says, the children are being kept back and they are being given extra work to do and she says well his tea is ready and she get to grab her son knew the teacher made a very very stupid mistake man because he as any fool knows you never get between a wild animal and it's young and that's what he tried to do and Mary just up with a fist and decked him doing he did and that wasn't enough for Mary she grabbed him by the scruff of the neck she dadded his head off the floor until she knocked him unconscious. We trickle of blood coming out the lug. She grabbed the boy, out the door, slammed the door in the way. And the rest of the bands sit and they're going, Oh my God, Mary Angel's killed the teacher. What sort of a detention would we get from that? <laughs> Imagine themselves as old men with long flowing beards still doing long division. Now some of the braver ones went over to him and they, um, they sprinkled some, splashed some water on his face and his eyes opened and he said in a kind of a weak voice, can I get a glass of water? So they went and they got him a glass of water and he drank and then he said, class dismissed. <laughs> they didn't need a second telling, they were out that door like a shot. But after that, Mary Angel became a bit of a hero to the Burns in Skillow in Westry because after that, the teacher never kept them back for extra lessons. <laughs> and that is, as they say, a true story. Yeah.